dependable, reliable, and tough. These are all words that I've heard people use to describe a diesel engine, and that's exactly what diesels are. You know, looking at diesels in a gasoline engine, there's just no comparison. But in order to be safe and reliable and all those other words we associate with diesels, the engine has to be maintained. And that's what this video is all about. You don't need to be a professional mechanic to keep an engine running smoothly. You just have to have a basic understanding of how everything works together. There are two types of diesel engines. You have a two-stroke engine and then a four-stroke. The most famous two-stroke engine is probably this Detroit here. Since the four-stroke is the most common, that's what we'll be concentrating on in this video. However, let's take a look at the differences between a four-stroke engine and a two-stroke engine. We'll look at this four-stroke one first. This will give you a basic understanding of how a diesel and gasoline engines work in general. As you can see, the first downstroke of the piston draws in air from outside through this open intake valve. The second stroke moves the piston upwards and compresses the air, thus heating it. At just the right time, the atomizer at the top of the cylinder squirts diesel fuel into the cylinder. Because of the heat and the pressure, the diesel explodes, forcing the piston down in what is called the power stroke. It is the power stroke that turns the crankshaft. The piston then moves up on its fourth and final stroke. This valve opens up, allowing the piston to push out the spent gases. The valve then closes and the process starts all over again with the intake valve opening. The flywheel is attached to the back of the crankshaft and it is a big, heavy disc of steel that helps smooth out the fluctuations caused by the reciprocating motion of the pistons. The two-stroke works on basically the same system except that the strokes are combined. Starting at the power stroke, the compressed air diesel mixture explodes and drives the piston down the cylinder. As it moves down the cylinder, the exhaust valves open and the piston uncovers ports in the cylinder wall. Fresh air is then blown in by the blower and helps force all of the exhaust gases out. The piston then reaches the bottom of its stroke and continues on up the cylinder, covering the inlet ports. The exhaust valves close. The fresh charge is now trapped inside the cylinder. The charge is compressed as the cylinder moves up to the top where the diesel is injected and the cylinder starts again. Let's now discuss the various components of the diesel engine, starting with the fuel system. The fuel system has a number of jobs to do. It must pump the fuel from the fuel tank using the lift pump or fuel transfer pump, as it is sometimes called. It's got to deliver it to the fuel injection pump. It is then pressurized and sent to the injectors at precise time sequences and amounts through steel pipes, which are called injector tubes. The injector is forced open by the pressure of the fuel and sprays the fuel in a fan-shaped pattern, much like when you spray perfume out of a bottle. On some engines, like this Detroit, the injector pump and injectors are combined in one unit and located inside the valve cover. Either way, they do the same thing. They deliver clean fuel at high pressure and spray it inside the cylinder at precisely the right time. Now, wait a minute. We mentioned clean. Let's talk about that for just a minute. Diesel engines, as we said before, are very reliable and they're long-lived pieces of machinery. But the components inside, items such as the fuel system, the lift pump, the injection pump, and the injectors, they're machined to very high tolerances, as much as one ten thousandths of an inch. And if any dirt gets into these very precise machine components, well, you know, they'll be ruined, and they will cease to function. The fuel injection pump can also be ruined by water. The machine surfaces inside will corrode. In order to keep the fuel clean, we have fuel filters housed in the supply line. Though one filter is essential, some systems have up to three or even more. One of the filters should be a water separator to take care of any water that may condense in your fuel tank or be present in the fuel when you buy it from the marina. The others are strainer and filter elements that can take particles out that are very small. We'll talk more about the maintenance of these items. Oh, by the way, one final thing. You may have noticed that there are two lines running from your fuel tank. One is a return line running from your engine. You see, the injector pump delivers a little more fuel to the injector than is actually injected into the engine. This is done for a very good reason. The extra fuel is used to help keep the injectors at a constant temperature. It also helps keep the injectors clean by having a constant flow of fuel going through it. Some engines have a fuel cooler so that the warm fuel that leaves the engine is cooled down so as to avoid causing condensation in your tank when the warm fuel combines with the cold fuel in the tank. 
The throttle control on your diesel engine is quite complicated. It works in conjunction with the governor to control the amount of fuel available to the injectors at any given moment. And if the engine is under a greater load, it allows more fuel to the engine to maintain that particular RPM. The stop control, on the other hand, usually cuts off the fuel supply inside the injection pump and stops the engine. Some engines have an emergency stop control that is located on the air intake, which cuts off the air supply completely to the engine, thus choking it. There are several types of cooling systems in diesel engines. You know, like gasoline engines, diesel engines generate an awful lot of heat when they're running. We need to get rid of this heat, so let's talk about how we keep the engine running at a constant temperature and how the entire cooling system functions. If your engine is too cold, it will sludge up. If it's too hot, it'll seize up. So you need to keep your cooling system in peak condition. Diesel engines perform best at a certain temperature. Now, one of the functions of the cooling system is to keep the engine running at this constant temperature. There are three methods of water cooling your diesel. Direct seawater cooling is usually found on small auxiliary diesels like this. The seawater is pumped into the engine and circulated around the engine, and then ejected out through the exhaust overboard carrying the waste heat with it. The temperature is controlled by the thermostat, which is a little valve that opens and closes according to temperature. This regulates the flow of water through the engine. Another method is keel cooling, which uses a circulation pump to circulate water. Fresh water is circulated in a closed circuit system. But look at this. As, as the water circulates, it moves around the outside of the boat where heat is transferred to the outside water. Major components of keel cooling, other than the piping, include the thermostat and the circulation pumps. The other cooling method is called heat exchanger cooling, and it works like this. The engine has a closed circuit engine system, a bit like the system in your car, where the cooling circulates around the engine using the circulation pump, and it's under pressure. It also uses a thermostat to keep that temperature constant. In your car, the heat is carried to the outside air by the radiator, which transfers the heat of the water in the tubes to the outside air around it. It is circulated through the engine by this pump. It comes in through this fitting over here, through a strainer and through pipes and hoses, to the heat exchanger, which is usually made of a seawater-resistant alloy, most often cupro-nickel. The seawater circulates through these tubes. It carries away heat from the pressurized cooling system within the engine. You may also have a heat exchanger for your transmission oil, and it might also be used to cool the return fuel. The exhaust system carries away all the waste gases, and on a raw water-cooled engine, it carries away all the wastewater as well. Most modern pleasure boats have a wet exhaust system. Now, these can be designed in a number of ways. Here's one way. The gases are on the inside of this pipe and there is a jacket on the pipe which carries the raw water downstream from the engine. The water and the gases combine in a muffler and are then ejected out the exhaust outlet. This type of system is very good until it corrodes. Then you got problems. The water will find its way from the outer jacket into the inside pipe and may flow back into the engine causing lots of problems. A more modern type of exhaust system is the water lift system. In this system, exhaust gases are mixed with the water after going through a short section of dry pipe with a bend in it. This bend will stop water from entering the engine. On some boats, you will notice insulation covering the exhaust pipe. If you're going to work on the exhaust system and you have an older boat, be very careful because there's probably asbestos lagging, which is very dangerous. Now, the modern replacement for this is fiberglass. Another feature of the water lift system is that there will probably be an anti-siphon loop in the water line that leaves the heat exchanger and goes to the exhaust system. Now this acts as a vacuum breaker to stop water from being sucked into the engine. Siphon loops are also found on marine heads that are also installed below the water line. It stops the head from filling up with water. This would cause your boat to sink and your wallet to empty. As I mentioned before, diesel engines need fuel and air to operate. The air intake on the diesel is quite straightforward. Air is sucked in past an air cleaner that takes out the dirt and the dust, keeping the air clean. The important thing to remember is that a diesel consumes huge quantities of air, and your engine room must be well ventilated for the diesel to run efficiently and cleanly. 
On smaller auxiliary engines without a blower or turbo, the air is sucked into the cylinders on each induction stroke of the piston. It's wise to mention a maintenance item that is seldom followed. Keep your air filter clean. On bigger engines and some high-performance diesels, there is a blower or turbocharger installed between the incoming air and the cylinder. The purpose of this blower or turbocharger is to increase the power of the engine by increasing the air supply. The blower consists of a long casing with these veined impellers. This forms an air compressor. It's important to remember that to gain the extra power, the engines are going to require more fuel. If your engine has a turbocharger, expect it to be more thirsty than the lower powered cousins. A good lubrication system is important in marine engines. The bottom area of the engine is called the crankcase, and underneath this is the oil pan. This is where the lubricating oil is stored. From here, an oil pump pulls the oil from the pan and pushes it through the engine. Now, once it gets up here, the oil drips back to the pan. While on the way, it will pass through an oil filter that will clean the oil and help get rid of some of the combustion products that find their way into the oil. Acid and sludges are the common culprits. And there often is an oil cooler which keeps the oil at a constant temperature and helps keep its viscosity in the range which is best for the engine. It's important to use the right kind of oil for your diesel engine. Combustion causes carbon and sulfur which are harmful to the bearing surfaces in your engine. Modern oils contain detergents that help to keep your oil clean, but they do not do that forever, so change your oil frequently and use the recommended oil. Quite different than the one in your car, but just as important, is the marine transmission. Sometimes the transmission is called the clutch or reverse gear, but no matter what it's called, there are only two basic gears, forward and reverse. Many times, reduction gears like this are incorporated to allow the engine to drive a larger propeller. Knowing what makes this thing run isn't going to help much if we can't start it. So let's talk a little bit about the batteries. The most important thing about a battery is that it be powerful enough to start the engine even in adverse conditions. Remember that humidity, temperature, and additional electrical accessories on the boat will affect the energy capacity of the battery. It is also important that the battery connection cables not be too long and that they should be attached directly to the battery. And the terminals on both ends must be completely corrosion free, as any corrosion will inhibit current flow along the cables. From the energy delivered by the battery, the starter motor begins its job. The starter is operated through a separate solenoid. The solenoid is actuated by either turning the ignition key or activating the starter switch. The battery is charged when needed by the alternator. The alternator is connected to a voltage regulator, which determines how much energy the battery needs in order to be recharged. The voltage regulator is sometimes located inside the alternator. The alternator is run by a V-belt. Alternating current, or AC, is produced by the alternator. Inside, there are rectifier diodes which convert the energy to direct current so the battery can be charged. These diodes are designed to constantly draw energy. For this reason, there is an auxiliary switch which breaks the current flow between the alternator and the regulator, and it is usually incorporated into the ignition switch. So when you turn off the engine, you turn off your alternator as well. You know, now that you have a basic knowledge of the components of your engine and you know how these parts all function and interact together, let's get to the purpose of this video, and that's how to maintain this engine in good running order. One of the most obvious but often overlooked maintenance points is simply keep the engine clean. This way, if there are any leaks or if repair is in order, the problem will be a lot easier to find and the tasks will be much easier. It's also important that the bilges be kept clean. Use a bilge cleaner to keep them free from fuel smell and grease. Before we get specific, let me mention a few general notes of maintenance. Like any piece of machinery, make sure you check the external nuts and bolts periodically to make sure that they're tight. Make sure the mounting bolts are also secure. If you spot an oil, water, or fuel leak, investigate it immediately. Twice yearly, check engine to prop shaft alignment, and maybe most important of all, keep your owner's manual handy. Each system within the engine has to be properly maintained for satisfactory performance. Now, the first area I want to show you is the fuel system. As I said earlier, 
For a diesel engine to run properly, it's vital to keep the fuel clean. There are several ways to help ensure this. First, only buy from a reputable dealer. Make sure the fuel that you use conforms to the engine manufacturer's specifications. If you buy your fuel from a local marina, it has probably been filtered at the pump. Some fuel tanks have a gauze trap in the fuel tank filter to help filter the fuel even more. A word of warning about filling your tank with diesel fuel. You may have noticed that diesel fuel tends to foam out as it nears the top of the tank. Now this will make a mess on your decks and may even run into the water. Always be careful when fueling up that the fuel flow going into the tank decreases as the tank begins to fill up. If you're planning on taking your boat to the islands or you are cruising in areas where you aren't sure about the quality of fuel available, it's a good idea to carry a strum box or a fuel strainer with you. In a pinch, you can even use a pair of pantyhose. If the fuel has not been kept fresh at the storage tank, you may have all sorts of organisms that are growing in it. So while we're adding fuel to the boat, it's a good idea to add an algicide or biocide. They're commercially available and will help prevent algae growth in your fuel. Follow the particular manufacturer's recommendations for the amount to add. Do this on a regular basis and you can prevent a lot of fuel problems. Remember that dirt in your fuel line can wreck your engine. Most diesels have a primary and secondary fuel filter. You should also have a water separator filter. You have to keep these filters clean and in optimum working functioning order. It's no good to have a filter if it's dirty. Check your water separator daily. Many water separators have a transparent bowl at the bottom so that you can see any contamination. Remember, fuel floats on top of the water so the contamination will be at the bottom of the filter. To remove the filter element, open the little petcock and drain the fuel into a container. The element should be serviced whenever the bowl shows heavy contamination or at specified service intervals. This is usually every 25 hours. To service a typical water separator, unscrew the filter top from the housing or unscrew the filter body from the mount depending upon which type you have. Pull out the old filter element and insert the new one. Check any gaskets or sealing rings on the body or on the mounting flange. Replace them if they're worn or grooved. Remember, the last thing you want in a diesel system is a leak. No matter how small, it will cause you big problems. If you keep your water separator clean, you shouldn't have to check your primary or secondary filters more than once, maybe every three months. But if your engine doesn't have a water separator, I recommend that you get one. By the way, don't forget to check your fuel lines carefully. If they are copper lines, check for any salt water damage. If they are flexible lines, check them for chafing. Also make sure that they are not too soft or brittle. It's a good idea to change the fuel lines completely now every three or four years. Diesel fuel contains sulfur, which is a highly corrosive item. Though the level of sulfur is supposed to be regulated, it can vary every time you fill up your tanks. There are two common primary filters, the screw-on disposable type and the replaceable element type. The replaceable element type of primary filter is serviced like this. First, Turn off your fuel supply. Unscrew the mounting bolt, and then gently remove the canister body with the element inside. It's a good idea to perform this operation over a bucket. You'll probably spill some diesel fuel doing this. Next, clean out the inside of the canister body with a lint-free rag and install a new element. On the mounting flange, you'll probably see a rubber sealing ring. Gently remove the old sealing ring using a scribe. Now insert the new sealing ring that should have come with the element. Take care not to twist it. Put the new element in the canister and fill the filter element as full as possible with diesel fuel. This will be beneficial when you bleed the engine later. Now, you want to mount the canister back on its mounting flange and tighten it down. Do not over tighten. For the screw-on type disposable element, treat it like the oil filter in your car. Unscrew it and remove the old filter. Now, take the new filter, moisten the rubber ring with a little diesel fuel, and screw it back on the mounting. 
The secondary filter is maintained pretty much the same way. The element itself is made out of a different material, but the servicing is the same. The only easy owner maintenance that your fuel injection or lift pump will need is to be kept clean. You'll also want to make sure that all the connections are secure. A few points you should know before we talk about bleeding your system is that some engines are fitted with a small lever at the bottom of the fuel lift pump. This lever is used to prime the system. If your engine does not have one, it may be fitted with an electric priming pump. It might also have a hand priming pump, but if your engine is not fitted with any priming equipment, you can buy an attachment that will help you prime the engine. I think the best way to go is with an operating or priming pump. The sole purpose of bleeding your engine is to get a continuous flow of fuel with no air in it through the tank to the injection pump and then to the injectors. This is accomplished by making sure there's no air in the filters or the injection pump. You see, diesels have two systems, a low pressure system and a high pressure system. Generally, the low pressure system will not purge itself of air, whereas the high pressure system will. The low pressure side consists of all the piping from the tank to the fuel transfer pump and from the fuel transfer pump to parts of the fuel injection pump. The high pressure side consists of the other parts of the injection pump, the injector tubes, and the injectors, except on those engines with unit injectors. A typical engine is bled as follows. First of all, make sure that your stop control is in the run position. The water separator should be full of fuel. Remember, there may be a lever on the bottom of your fuel lift pump or hand priming pump. If your water separator is mounted correctly between the tank and the fuel lift pump, and if your electric priming pump is mounted correctly between the tank and the water separator, then it's easy to bleed the system. Crack open the bleed point. Turn on the electric priming pump and you'll see air and fuel bubble out. When you see clear fuel, close the lid. For the primary and secondary filters, the same procedures will apply. Just identify the bleed points on the filters and on the injector pump. Check your owner's manual for the exact locations. Now bleed each section in turn. Begin with the primary filter. Crack open the bleed point until clear fuel comes out, then close it. Then go to the secondary filter, and then finally the fuel injection pump. As clear fuel issues from the bleed points, close each bleed point in turn, starting with the lowest point first. On the injector pump, always make sure that you close the lowest bleed point first. These steps should ensure that the engine is bled. Now your engine should start. After you have found these priming points, it's not a bad idea to mark them with a contrasting luminescent paint. This way you can find them in the dark with a flashlight should you ever be stranded out in the open water at night. It might be necessary for you to turn over the engine a few times with the starter motor while the primer pump is running, so fuel can get through to the lift pump. Normally you won't need to bleed the injector lines. If you don't have an electric priming pump but do have a manual lever on the fuel transfer pump, you follow basically the same procedures. If it is difficult to lift the lever, the engine has stopped with the lift pump drive cam in the full stroke position. You will have to turn it over manually about a half a turn to free up the pump. You may have to fill the water separator by hand until it overflows. Once you've done that, proceed as before, opening all the bleed points and then closing them after the fuel emerges air free. If your engine is fitted with a manual priming pump, again you will proceed much the same way. The important thing is to simply identify the bleed points. We will now show you how to bleed some of the more popular engines. Bleed a Perkins engine, you'll need two wrenches, five eighths and a five sixteenths. First point you bleed at is your secondary fuel filter by loosening up the bleed screw on top of the filter. This is a low pressure fuel pump for bleeding the secondary filter and for bleeding your injection pump. By pumping this ladder, you pump fuel from the tank to your filters and to your injection pump. Pump your lift pump down here till you get fuel out, no air, and tighten your bleed screw. You know I have fuel. 
The second point for bleeding the engine would be on the fuel injection pump. Using a 5 16 wrench, loosen up the bleed screw on the side of the pump. Then pump your lift pump, then you get fuel out of your injection pump. Retighten the bleed screw. After bleeding the low pressure side of the fuel system, you have to bleed the high pressure side by loosening the injection lines up where they go into the injectors. Using a 5 8 wrench, loosen approximately two turns. To bleed the 4 236 engine, you will need the same wrench as a 5 8 and a 5 16. On a 4 236, this is your low pressure fuel pump. By pumping this lever, you bleed the low pressure side of your fuel system. Bleed this primary fuel filter first at your bleed screw using a 5 8 wrench. Loosen your bleed screw, pump your left pump, you get fuel out of your top screw here, and then retighten the screw. On the 4236, you have two points to bleed on the fuel injection pump. You have a bleed screw here and a bleed screw here. Using a 5 16 wrench, loosen the bottom one first. Pump your lift pump so you get fuel out the bottom bleed screw. Tighten the screw and loosen the top screw. Pump your lift pump so you get fuel out your top screw. Then retighten. To bleed the high pressure side of your 4236, you loosen the nuts going into the injector, injectors. Loosen the injection nuts going into the first two injectors, approximately two turns. Roll the engine over with the starter until you see fuel coming out the two lines. Then retighten them, and your engine is ready to run. Bleed the 4108 Perkins, you will need a 5 8 and a 5 16. Bleed the 108, first point is the low pressure or the secondary fuel filter. With a 5 8 wrench, you loosen the bleed screw on top of the filter. And pumping lever on the low pressure fuel pump so you see fuel coming out with no air. Retighten your bleed screw. Next point for bleeding the 4108 is the fuel injection pump. Using a 5 16 wrench, loosen the bleed screw on the fuel injection pump. Then pumping your low pressure fuel pump until you see fuel coming out. No air. Retighten your bleed screw. Next, we'll, we'll, loose, we'll bleed our high pressure side of the fuel system by loosening up the injection lines going into the injectors. Using a 5 8 wrench, Loosen them approximately two turns. With the starter, roll the engine over until you see fuel coming out of the injection lines. Then retighten the lines and your engine should start. To bleed the Northern Lights diesel, loosen the bleed screw next to the fuel filter. Now, operate the fuel priming pump until a solid stream is seen coming from the bleed screw. Once the air has been purged, tighten the bleed screw. Move to the injection pump and locate the two bleed screws here. Loosen these two and operate the priming pump until you have bled the air from the fuel filter to the injection pump. When you see a solid stream of fuel, tighten the screws. Now, follow the fuel lines to the fuel injectors. While operating the priming pump, loosen the nuts on the fuel injectors. When you have fuel present at the injectors, lock down the fuel priming pump. Now turn over the engine a few times until you see a solid stream of fuel coming out of the injectors. Tighten the fuel injector nuts and you are done. On the five kilowatt model, Loosen the bleed nut on the fuel filter.
Now, operate the fuel lift pump until all of the air is purged in the fuel filter and you see a solid stream of fuel. Now tighten the bleed screw. Next, open the bleed screw on top of the injection pump and operate the lift pump until a solid stream of fuel emerges. Now, tighten this screw. Let's move on to the injectors. Loosen the nuts on the injectors and turn over the engine a few times until you see a solid stream of fuel. Now tighten down the nuts and you are finished. On the universal diesel, you will use your electric fuel pump for priming. Loosen the bleed screw on the secondary fuel filter and bleed the engine until a solid stream of fuel is visible from the fitting. Now tighten the screw home. As these steel nuts and screws are set in aluminum housings, care should be taken not to over tighten these fittings as they will strip. Let's move on to the fuel injection pump. Loosen the bleed screw at the base of the pump. When solid fuel emerges here, tighten the screw. We now have solid fuel through the injection pump. Further bleeding should not be necessary. If further bleeding is called for, loosen the injector nuts and turn over the engine a few times until solid fuel emerges from the fittings. Now retighten the injector fittings. Care should be taken when working around this area since the fuel is under a pressure in excess of 2,000 pounds per square inch. So make sure to wear adequate protection. The first thing you want to make sure is that the lift pump has a full range of travel. If you cannot fully operate the lever, bump the engine a few times to rotate the cam. Open the bleed screw on the injection pump. While operating the lift pump, observe the fuel emerging from this fitting. When you have a solid stream, tighten the screw. The engine should now be fully bled. However, if the unit still won't start, it will be necessary to bleed the injectors. Loosen each fuel injector nut and turn over your engine. When solid fuel is present at the fitting, tighten and move on to the next injector. This will fully bleed the fuel system. To bleed your Yanmar diesel, open the bleed screw on the fuel filter. Now operate the lift pump until a steady stream of fuel emerges from the fitting. Open the screw on the injection pump and operate the lift pump until all air is purged from the fuel system. Then tighten the screw. Now follow the fuel lines from the injection pump to the injectors. Loosen each nut and turn over the engine until a solid stream of fuel is present at the fitting. Then tighten the nut back. To bleed the Kohler diesel engine, first open the bleed screw on the fuel filter. Next, operate your fuel pump until a solid stream of fuel is seen at the bleed screw. Now tighten the screw. Still operating the fuel pump, open the bleed screw on your injection pump. After you have purged all of the air, tighten the screw. Follow your fuel lines up to the injectors. Open the injector fittings one at a time and rotate the engine until solid fuel emerges then tighten the fittings. To bleed the Caterpillar diesel, open the petcock and operate your fuel pump. When solid fuel emerges, close the petcock. Open each injector nut and operate the fuel pump. When the air is removed from the line, tighten the fitting. When you have bled all of the fuel lines, the engine is ready to operate. In bleeding the Detroit diesel, make sure your primary fuel filter has fuel in it. Now connect your fuel pump to your secondary fuel filter. Disconnect your return line and place it into a container. Next, operate your fuel pump until solid fuel emerges from the return line. The way to determine if your engine actually needs bleeding is to listen for injector creak as you start the engine. This sound is made by the injectors at the moment of injection. You can also feel it as a knock in the appropriate fuel line. If you hear it, you can dispense with the whole bleeding process because fuel is actually reaching the injectors. So if your engine is getting fuel and won't start, then it's got to be the air supply that's the problem. The diesel engine requires enormous amounts of clean air to run efficiently. Most engines have an air filter or cleaner to help purify the air taken in. Keep these clean.
Like the fuel filters, they are no good if you don't. Some of these elements are washable or cleanable. Some are replaceable. Do whatever is required by your engine. If your engine has a turbocharger or blower, and if the turbocharger has a special oil filter, make sure that this filter is clean and replace the elements as often as the manufacturer recommends, following the maintenance procedures in your owner's manual. The main problem you can have with your engine's exhaust system is deterioration, so it's important that you just check for this problem periodically. Replace any flexible hoses and clamps and any other parts which might have become worn. Check any insulation for cracks and repairs or replace as necessary. The most important thing is that you have no leaks. As I'm sure you know, changing the oil and its filter is very important to prolonging the life of this engine. If you use your boat often, you should change the oil and the filter twice a season or more. If you only occasionally use the boat, once a season is usually sufficient. Don't neglect this though. Dirty oil is damaging to the bearing surfaces of the motor. First of all, let's drain the oil. I like to have the engine a little warm so the oil drains easier. To drain the oil, undo the drain plug in the sump if it's accessible and let the waste oil run into a suitable container. If it's not accessible, you can drain the oil through the dipstick tube. On some of the bigger engines, you'll find an oil drain point handily mounted on the side of the block. All you have to do is open a valve or two, depending upon your model, and pump the oil out manually or electrically, depending upon the type of installation. You notice we're wearing gloves because the oil is warm, and you don't want to take a chance of getting burned. After we finish draining the oil, it's time to change that grimy filter. Some mountings are threaded, and the entire unit unscrews. Sometimes you have to use a filter wrench. After you have removed the filter, discard the element and wipe the mount clean. If it is a screw-on replaceable element with clean oil, wipe the rubber sealing ring on the new filter to lubricate it and screw it on hand tight. Use your filter wrench to tighten it one quarter turn more, but don't force it. If the element is inside the canister, take out the old element. Clean it out and then install the new element with any appropriate gaskets or sealing rings. It's a bit like changing one of the fuel filter elements as we described before. Now reassemble it and tighten it. Now let's replace the oil. Always use the grade of oil specified by the engine's manufacturer and just pour it in like this. Don't forget to add an extra one half to one quart of oil or more, depending upon your oil filter size, to compensate for the amount of oil you lost when you changed it. The next system we'll check is the cooling system. Regularly check the water level if you have a closed system. I like to check it about every time I start the boat. To check the coolant level, remove the header tank filler cap, which looks like the radiator cap on your car. Notice I said coolant. It's not good for any engine to run on just pure water. It's much better to run on a mix of coolant and water. Sometimes people refer to the coolant as antifreeze but whatever you call it, it contains lubricants and anti-corrosive agents which help keep your cooling system in peak condition and it aids to lubricate your water pump. Depending upon the geographical area in which you have your boat, the coolant water ratio will vary. A good rule of thumb is a 50-50 mix. Now, with the cap off, check your level. If you're down on coolant, look for a leak. We'll be covering cooling system problems later, so if you think you have a leak, Keep watching. Before you replace the header tank cap, look at it and see if it is in good shape. Check the rubber gasket and make sure it is in good condition. Because your engine heat builds up pressure in the cooling system, it's not a bad idea to buy a lever type cap with a pressure relief valve like this one. This way, if you have a problem and have to remove the filler cap while the engine is hot, you can release the pressure safely. If your engine is raw water cooled, you should have an impeller type water pump. On some smaller diesel engines, the water goes through the transmission housing first, but usually the pump will be found mounted either in the front or the back of the engine. To locate the pump, follow the intake water hose through the through hull, past the strainer, and here it is. Now, let's look inside the water pump. 
turn off your through hole and remove the cover plate from the pump body. There are usually four to six screws holding it on. Inside, you'll see the impeller blades. See them? Carefully pry out the impeller with a flat edge screwdriver. Sometimes needle nose pliers will work. Whatever you use, be gentle. Now that the impeller is out, I look for any kinds of scrapes or cracks that might show impending impeller failure. I usually do this once a season. This one looks fine, but if it had any damage at all, like this other one, I would replace it. I always recommend carrying a spare. These look fine, so we're now going to reinstall them. We'll just go in reverse. Here's a little tip, though. Before you push the impeller back into place, apply a little bit of liquid dish soap to the blades. Now, put it in. Put on the gasket, replace the cover plate, reopen the through hole, and you're finished. Not so bad, was it? If you notice that the pump itself seems to be leaking, call your particular engine dealer and ask them if the pump can be rebuilt. Sometimes they can, depending upon the make. However, if they can't, simply buy a new one and reinstall. If your system has zinc anodes to help prevent corrosion, check them every three months or so. They're usually located near the water pump or on the heat exchanger itself. To replace them, simply unscrew the plug they're attached to, remove whatever is left of the old anode from the plug, and screw in the new one. Screw it back into the water pump or heat exchanger like this. Now this little bit of maintenance can save you an awful lot of headaches. As I mentioned before, your heat exchanger is made of a copper nickel alloy. Well, as strong and as sturdy as it may be, it is not corrosion proof. By using this little zinc anode as a sacrificial piece of metal, it can literally save you hundreds of dollars in buying a new heat exchanger. If your engine is running at the proper temperature and your coolant is clean, then your thermostat is probably working just fine. The thermostat is located right here. There's really not a whole lot of maintenance you can do on it other than replace it when it goes bad, and you'll know when that happens because your temperature won't stay where it ought to be. Now what happens if you open your header tank filler cap and notice that the coolant is filthy? The answer is obvious. You have to clean it. It's not really a big job. There's a drain plug on the side of the engine which will allow coolant to spill into the bilge. Drain the system with the filler cap off and then wash it through with fresh water until the drainage comes out clean and clear. If your coolant is very dirty, you may have to use a chemical cleaner. In that case, follow the instructions on the package. Once the drainage water is clear, replace the drain plug and refill the system with a 50-50 coolant water mix. Now you may have to bleed the water system if there are any high points in the engine where air can be trapped. You can do this by squeezing the hoses as your engine runs. You should really only have to change and flush your cooling system once every two or three years. I mentioned earlier about this raw water strainer. If you don't have a strainer, it's a good idea to install one. It will keep a lot of debris from entering and possibly damaging your cooling system. These strainers are usually transparent, so you can see a buildup of debris. The important thing is to check it regularly and keep it clean. To clean the strainer, simply turn off the through hole. Open the lid or clamp on the strainer housing and remove the strainer basket. Many times you can just clean it with your hands. After you have cleaned the basket, reinsert it. Check the housing gasket, and if it looks worn, replace it. Don't forget to reopen the through hole. If you have a leak of coolant, you'll notice it really easily. Coolant is usually green, and a small leak at a hose clamp or a gasket will be noticeable. If you're losing coolant and cannot find the leak, it's usually one of two things, a leak in your heat exchanger or an internal engine leak. Sometimes you can find the heat exchanger leak by looking at the exhaust water. If you see green in it, that's where your coolant's going. Take off the heat exchanger by unbolting it and removing the hoses. Then take it to your local radiator shop and have them pressure check it for leaks and see if the tubes are plugged. This is also a common cause for what's called engine temperature creep. Sometimes they can solder it and repair it. On the subject of heat exchangers, if your transmission fluid suddenly looks like milk or strawberry soda, then your trans cooler is leaking. And if you suddenly get lots of water in your fuel, then it's your fuel cooler.
fix those heat exchangers right away or replace them. Another way of finding a heat exchanger leak is to take off the header cap when the engine is not too hot, but warmed up. Be very careful not to get scalded. When you do this, look inside the header tanks and see if the coolant water is bubbling a lot. If it is, then your leak is probably not in the heat exchanger, but in the cylinder head gasket or in the cylinder head itself. If it's not bubbling, there's probably a hole in the heat exchanger. A cylinder head or gasket leak will often evidence itself in hard starting or white smoke as the water turns into steam when running. The cure is to pull the cylinder head and gasket and make the appropriate repairs, a job you'll probably want to leave to the mechanics. The other kind of engine leak usually manifests itself as water in the oil from bad cylinder liner seals. The water leaks out under pressure into the oil. The cure is a rebuild. Engine temperature creep, which we mentioned before, is caused by a number of factors. The most common one being a blockage in your C strainer. The other cause, a gradual plugging up of your heat exchanger. See these two examples? Notice how this one is nice and clean. It can conduct all of the heat to the raw water as it passes through the heat exchanger. This other one, however, is scaled up and cannot properly pass heat. Over time, your engine temperature will slowly creep and eventually you'll have to clean out your heat exchanger. This heat exchanger has removable end caps so that you can inspect the core rather easily. If you see signs of scaling or plugging, take your heat exchanger to the local radiator shop for a thorough cleaning, as they're the ones best equipped to do this job. Let's move on to the transmission. First, you should check that there are no transmission oil leaks and that the oil level is maintained. The oil in the gearbox doesn't get contaminated by combustion products, so it doesn't need to be changed too often. The elements in any fitted filters should be changed according to the manufacturer's recommendations, just like we change the oil filter. Make sure these breathers on top of the casing are not blocked. Most transmissions use hydraulic fluid while others use the same oil that you use in your engine. Make sure you put the correct type and grade of oil into your transmission. If you have any doubt and can't find the correct specifications in your owner's manual, call your dealer. They'll be glad to assist you. Check your fluid every time you leave the dock. Most hydraulic transmissions are normally checked in neutral. If all of a sudden you see milk or strawberry soda, look at your oil cooler. Also, keep an eye on the hoses to the cooler. They're high pressure and you don't want them to leak. Check the controls on the gearbox once a season. Make sure all the clamps and cable connections are tight and functioning properly. If you find anything wrong, fix it now. If you don't, you might later find yourself losing control of your boat. While we're on the subject of transmission control, some engines are fitted with a neutral safety switch operated by the gear shift. Every time you start your engine, make sure you are in neutral. If you don't, the engine won't start. Let's look at the engine starting battery. You always want to have a battery powerful enough for the job. Check with your owner's manual to find the right size. When you buy a battery, get the one that has the longest guarantee. Don't skimp. Buy a respected brand name designed specifically for marine use. Believe me, it's worth the extra pennies not to get stranded out on the water somewhere. Most boats will have two or more banks of batteries. One bank is just for starting. The others are for the boat's accessories. However, no matter what the battery is for, it should be properly installed in acid-proof boxes. They should also be connected to a battery disconnect switch such as this one. This switch connects all the batteries together with the starter motor to give you additional cranking power for those times you might need it. Long cables can reduce the amount of voltage that reaches the starter. If they're ever chafed or corroded, replace them immediately. And of course, you know how to keep all the connections clean. If you have corrosion present, sometimes you might as well not even have a battery. When you leave the vessel, it's not a bad idea to turn off the battery switch. However, for flotation safety, make sure that your bilge pumps are still connected to the battery through an automatic switch and not disconnected at the battery disconnect switch. You never know when a battery is going to go, so I try to keep from getting caught off guard by occasionally checking the batteries with a hydrometer.
It's best that the outside temperature is around 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Even if the temperature is lower, the specific gravity will read high. If the temperature is high, the specific gravity will read low. However, if there's no charge, there won't be any reading. Here's how you do it. Take the cap off the cell, draw out some water, and then take a reading. This one's fine. If you find that the charge is low, take the battery to a service center and have it charged. If it won't take a charge or loses it quickly, then guess what? It's time to get a new battery. There are marine battery chargers that can be installed so that your battery stays charged when not in use. Some are automatic and some are adjustable. These need to be set correctly for your particular battery. You never want to overcharge. When checking your battery charge, check the fluid level also. If it's low, add water. Distilled water is usually recommended, but if that's not readily available, any water is better than none. Expect the charge to drop a little initially when adding additional liquid. We'll continue our inspection, but first I'm going to turn off the battery switch. This will prevent any accidental shocks. Graphite helps prevent corrosion. So rub a bit on the ignition key and insert it into the switch a few times like I'm doing now. Now, take a look behind the panel where few men dare to go. Look at all the wires that lead to the ignition switch. Make sure the insulation around the wires isn't damaged and that all wires are well secured. Check your engine's belts every few weeks or so. Use your finger to test the tension. Always keep extra belts. You never know when one's going to break. To change a belt is quite easy. You usually just have to loosen the alternator bracket, swing the alternator in, remove the belt from the pulleys, and replace it with a new one. The size of the belt is usually marked on the top of the belt. Write down the number and keep it in a safe place. This way you can always get extra belts at the marine store without having to take off the old belt and measure it. Install the new belt, Swing the alternator back, keeping tension on the belt, and tighten the bracket again. After running the belt for a few hours, check the tension again. Adjust it after you've run one hour, and then readjust it after you've run eight hours. A new belt is prone to stretch. Hoses are especially subject to wear. Some of these carry water, others fuel and oil. But whatever they carry, you need to make sure that they're kept in optimum shape. The first step is to squeeze them. If they feel soft or mushy, they'll need to be replaced. They'll also need to be replaced if they become brittle. Take a piece of the hose you're replacing to your marine dealer and have him match it for you. This could save you a trip or two to the store should you get the wrong hose because you were guessing. Make sure your hose clamps are of marine grade and are made of stainless steel. Be also sure that the screw on that clamp is stainless. To check to make sure that they really are stainless steel, use the old magnet trick. If it sticks, they're not. It's a good idea to use two clamps any time that you have a connection below the waterline. This way the boat won't sink if one clamp fails. Make sure that all the clamps are secure, but don't over tighten. During your yearly inspection of the engine, check all of the electrical connections. Just follow them around as you would a road map, making sure that all the wires are secure and in good condition. Just a word of caution. The diesel is strong, but it's also delicate in some ways. You should never alter the injection pump timing, injector setting pressure, or fuel pump setting without the proper knowledge or equipment. The manufacturer's original settings should always be maintained. Unless you live in a part of the country where the climate is warm year-round, you'll probably want to put your boat into hibernation for the winter. That's the time to begin thinking about winterizing your engine. Your engine's enemy is not overuse, but lack of use. After all, left alone without proper winterizing, your engine can deteriorate worse than it would with several seasons of hard use. Here's what you'll need for winterizing your diesel. A pump-type oil can, a supply of lubricant for the transmission and crankcase, oil filters, and a can of spray rust preventative. Before the boat is hauled, change the crankcase oil as I showed you earlier. Make sure that you dispose of this properly 
and that does not mean in the water. But of course you know better than that. Replace the oil filter and add fresh oil. Be careful here not to spill oil in the bilge. What a mess when that happens. Now, crank the engine up and let it run a few minutes to distribute the oil. Acids and moisture build up in used oil. The purpose of changing the oil now is to prevent rust and corrosion from building up inside the engine while it's sitting quietly. If your raw cooling pump uses a flexible neoprene impeller, it should be removed for the season. If so, just open up the pump and remove the impeller like we did before. Next season, you can easily reinstall it or replace it with a new one. Fuel oil deteriorates when it sits. So whenever I winterize my engine, I like to pump or drain all of the fuel oil from the fuel tank. It lightens the vessel, and that way I can start my new season with fresh fuel. If you drain the fuel, remember that the next season you will have to bleed the system. Air can enter the supply pipe or siphon tube. But you know how to bleed the system, so that's no problem, right? If you don't want to bother with draining and bleeding, you can skip this procedure by adding an inhibitor to the fuel tank. Either is okay. Drain the cooling system. Close the drains and then fill the system with a 50-50 mix of water and antifreeze. Run the engine for about five minutes to distribute and mix the solution. You want to eliminate all plain water in the engine to prevent any type of freezing. Normal winterization requires putting a couple of ounces of oil into each cylinder. To do this, sometimes you have to remove the injector or glow plugs. It's not that difficult. The glow plugs will typically just screw out and you can use a long nose oil can to pour the oil in. Then simply replace the glow plugs. However, if you have to remove the injectors, you may need a special tool and you will most certainly need a new seating washer. Look at your owner's manual or ask a mechanic before you start removing the injectors. While it's a simple process, there are so many different kinds that there is no way we can cover all of them in this video. But whatever you do, don't knock or damage the atomizer end of the injector when you take it out. Do not wipe any carbon on the tip with a rag. It may plug holes. After you have put the oil into the cylinders, turn the engine over about a dozen times, but don't let it fire. You can do this by having your stop control engaged so that no fuel can get through the injection pump. Now, don't crank the engine again until it's recommissioned. After the engine is shut off, spray some rust inhibitor into the air intake. Make sure the engine is off. You don't want the inhibitor going through the engine. Left in one spot, your V-belts and bearings will develop flat spots. We can keep this from happening by taking the tension off the belts by loosening these bolts. It's best to remove your battery from the boat while it's in storage. Take it home and keep it charged during the winter so that it will be in great shape for spring. Test it with a hydrometer just like you would if it was still on the boat. Check and fill your transmission as we talked about before. Spray the back of the instrument panel with water repellent. You want to keep all those connections clean and dry. To provide a final coat of protection, spray the entire engine with a rust inhibitor or a light oil. For final protection, cover the entire engine with a loose canvas tarp. That will let the engine breathe. In other words, avoid vinyl or plastic. After your engine's long winter's nap, you'll want to recommission it. Check the electrical connections, clamps, pipes, hoses, belts, and cables. Make sure they're supple and in generally good repair. You never know what can happen during the winter. Then, even though you're anxious to get out on the water, try to hold your horses and go over the points I showed you in the maintenance section of this tape. This will help you to make certain you have a great season of boating. Under the best circumstances, things can go wrong. Engines and their parts will wear out and break down. And usually they do this at the most inopportune times. You know what I'm talking about. Hoping that nothing ever does go wrong, let's go over some of the things that could possibly happen and then discuss their probable causes. Let's troubleshoot.